What's your minimum specification? So hi everyone, and welcome to another of Ian's interviews. Today my guest, you already know, he's all over the internet and all he does is talk GPUs. I'm speaking to Intel's Raja Kaduri. He's the general manager of AXG, their accelerated compute, accelerator graphics. I always forget what the, uh, what the acronym stands for, but Raja, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. It's accelerated computing systems and graphics. And uh, so we combined the C and S to be an X, which, as you know, is one of my favorite <laughs> alphabets. <laughs> so so going, going on to your position as head of AXG, you got that position in mid-21, previously being the GM of architecture, graphics, and software. So what exactly is in your wheelhouse these days? Desktop and enterprise graphics, I get, but are we talking other accelerators or what have you? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks and good question. So the all of our uh, um, you know Xeon HPC line is um, in accelerated computing graphics, right? So the way uh, uh, you know we have uh, kind of you know divide and conquer on the focus side. Right, you know, we saw that uh, this notion of accelerated computing, which is both like CPU platforms, GPU platforms, and other accelerators, uh, like for example, recently you heard some news around blockchain, uh, and you know there are other interesting things we are working on too. So all of those are in the accelerated computing. So I mean, normally when I hear accelerators, I think FPGAs, but that's under PSG and networking, and that's under its own network group. How much synergy is there between you and them? Uh, you know, qu quite a bit, and particularly software and interconnects and fabrics and all. Um, that's a good question, by the way. Uh, the uh, the simple way I define uh, what's in accelerated computing, if you're talking, uh, you know, uh, let's say 100 tops or more, <laughs> right? So it's high-performance accelerated computing. Uh, maybe we, you know we didn't want the acronym to be too large, right? So it, it it's uh, it's shortened, but but really all the high performance stuff is in AXG. So I I initially reached out for this interview because Intel started talking about Zeta Scale, and then you started also talking about Metaverse. Um, I kind of want to go into those topics, but I would be lynched if I didn't ask you a question about GPUs. Mm -hmm. So. Which of your children do you love more, Alchemist or Ponte Vecchio? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, you know both, <laughs> right? <laughs> both, both Ian. <laughs> so you can't ask me to choose. At least on camera, <laughs> I get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. That's kind of why I asked it. Uh, <laughs> But so realistically, internally, you're working on the next generation, the one after, and probably the one after that. As general manager, I can imagine that in any given day, you're in meetings about Gen 1, Gen 2, and then a meeting about Gen 4, and then a meeting about Gen 3. Mm -hmm. Have you ever turned around and said, this week, I'm only focusing about, say, Gen 3 or something similar? Because how much headspace does that upcoming product versus future product have to occupy especially you know today you're talking to me the press i'm going to ask about gen one stuff kind of <laughs> yeah 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 no i there are weeks uh, particularly when uh, you know i call it kind of you know in the in the creation mode um when we really kind of you know uh, uh, finalize the architecture and you know the 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 core bets we are going to make on which technology and all i go into that's the only thing i do um, you know, that entire week uh, or entire day uh, type of stuff. I'm not, um, you know, personally that good at like kind of, you know, context switching <laughs> and being very productive. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, the next uh, a couple of months, uh, as an example, will be very much on, you know, trying to get the, the Gen 1 stuff that, 
uh, out into the market, right? So, you know, pretty much very much what's, you know, right in front of our noses to get all of that stuff done. But yeah, good question. Yeah, you know, my focus keeps shifting. I mean, yeah, uh, a, a lot of people <laughs> want to ask me about, you know, desktop graphics and stuff, but it's uh, s s still planned for Q1 launch desktop and mobile. Just want to clarify. Yes, we have, you know, series of launches uh, coming up, uh, Ian, right? You know, we have partners, we have OEMs and the, the 50 to 60 systems that we uh, announced at uh, CES. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we are working away, right? You know, the different SKUs with the different focus on gaming, game compatibility, game performance and all. As soon as we feel like, hey, this is good, we ship it, <laughs> right? And so uh, still a, a lot of hard work ahead of us. And we do uh, really understand, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the user uh, anticipation and, uh, and the demand too right now with the, uh, with the situation the market is in. And we are, we're doing our best to get the, the product at a, at a finished stage that we feel like, hey, this is good, right? To, to get it in your hands. So pivoting to Zeta scale, so, you know, for some context for people who don't know, Intel made waves in October by announcing a Zeta scale initiative right on the eve of the industry breaching that exascale barrier. Zeta scale at 30,000 feet is a thousand X increase in performance and Intel claimed a 2027 ish timeframe. So in this context, when I say exascale, I mean one super one supercomputing system implementing one exaflop of double precision compute, all 64-bit math. And Intel has gone on the record, you've gone on the record, even saying that Aurora, the upcoming supercomputer for Argon, will be in excess of two exaflops of 64-bit double precision compute. What I want to ask you is, is a really specific question about what Intel means by Zeta scale in this context. When we say exascale we're talking about one machine one exaflop double precision mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. by zeta scale do you mean one machine one zeta flop double precision 64-bit compute short answer yes ian um and uh that's good also, that's good <laughs> yeah and uh, i also want to frame it uh, i mean if you recall i've been uh talking about the need for thousand x more compute or 1000x, you know, performance per watt improvement uh, for a little while. Um, in fact, I think it, uh, I talked about it in my hot chips keynote uh, and, uh, and a few other events as well. The reason is the, the demand for that compute already exists today, right? You know, just taking a concrete example of if I want to train one of the interesting neural nets, in real time, not in you know minutes, hours, days, right? In real time, the need for that is there today. The demand for it is there today. So, in many ways, we got to figure out as a technology industry, and that's the fun of being here. Like, how do we get there, right? So, the Zeta scale is a you know kind of a nice numerical way to say it because we have been talking you know ten. 10 power 18 with exascale, you know, kind of the 10 power 21. But the essence of uh, the Zeta scale initiative is the 1000x to me than kind of the current performance per watt baseline, right? Uh, and we'll get more into that. I'm sure you'll ask questions on, on why and all that stuff. But the current baseline, if you just think about it, right? You know, the current, what we are using to build exascale, what others are using to build exascale. The technology foundations for those were laid out more than 10 years ago, right? What process technology, what uh, packaging technology, those were in the works and in various forms of manufacturing over the last decade. So exascale is the culmination of a decade plus long work into a product. So but by that token, would that mean that when you say Zeta scale today, a lot of, or essentially all of the work that would go into it is already happening? Is already happening. And in fact, by, um, 
you know, I think Pat said it, uh, you know, quite well, uh, that the amount of time it took from, you know, each generation from, you know, the from Terra to Peta, Peta to uh, Exa, right? Uh, and the timeline we set from Exa to Zeta is actually shorter than the previous transitions. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that is bold, that's ambitious, but um, to unleash the technology pipeline, right, you know, on the foundational physics, right, you know, we do need different physics, more physics, right, to solve the problem. Um, so when you have that, the moonshot type of initiatives, right, the technology industry, both are in-house manufacturing process technology teams and the scientists that work on it, and some of our partners in the equipment industry, in uh, IP industry and all, it's a call for action for all of them that, hey, because of the demand exists today and the AI workloads and the span uh, and the, our, our desire to simulate things, uh, you know, we can, right? You know, excellent work done, by the way, recently by, uh, uh, you know, our uh, uh, friends at uh, the, the Fugaku supercomputer using that facility, uh, that capability to simulate the spread of COVID, right? How is that, um, you know, impacting and all? Now, I wish we had those simulations done the beginning of 2020, right? We had more, better understanding earlier, but there is no reason for us to be waiting for the next, you know, uh, big uh, event, whether it's a natural, uh, you know, a calamity ahead of us or things to be start simulating them um, at Earth scale, at planet scale, uh, you know, and, and that's what computing is about. In fact, in many ways, uh, Ian, it's one of the cheapest resources in the universe from an, <laughs> oh, if you think about it, right, computing, right? It's actually <laughs> compared to many of the inventions, many of the ways we spent electricity on and all, right? You know, the, the, the delivered work per watt of computing is super energy efficient. But it's not enough. It's not enough. Yes. It's not enough. Yeah, thousand X just three um, zeros. <laughs> yeah, just just three zeros. Um it's interesting that you mentioned Fugaku because the the chip that they use is built primarily for sixty four bit double precision compute. Um but you also mentioned AI in there, which is a mix of you know uh, quantization and reduced precision compute. Again, sorry to ask this question to bang on about it, but when we mm -hmm. talk Zeta scale, we are talking double precision. Even with everything else involved, we are still talking double precision. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. uh, I think there are other uh, advance. You know, during the journey towards Zeta scale, you, uh, I think we we expect us and others will take advantage of this other kind of, I call it architectural innovations based on the workload, whether it is like, you know, lower precision bit formats or some other interesting forms of compression, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, they, they'll all be part of the journey. Uh, but to uh, drive a set of mathematical initiatives uh, or kind of math-based initiatives on architecture, memory, interconnect, and process technology, we made it very simple, right? It's Zeta scale with 64-bit floating point. Okay, well, uh, where do the circuits need to get to to be able to do that? You you mentioned earlier that this is um, an acceleration of the industry progression going from um, Terra to Peta, Exa, and on to Zeta. Um, if I just bring up the top 500 supercomputer charts that they produce every six months, we're about to achieve exaflop computers today. And in that 2027 time frame, you know, roughly that um, you've already talked about, their graphs extrapolate out to only a 10 exaflop system, not a thousand exaflop system, right? That's a bit of a jump. And naturally, a top supercomputer like that requires large investment. It requires a specific entity to build, contracts in place. Aurora's first contract is pre-2018. Mm -hmm. So how much needs to be in place very soon to hit that thousand x but yeah. also how much of a step function should we think about z scale in this context yeah. you know either a step up or a smooth progression or one key thing 
to be able to do this kind of jumps is that the system architecture needs to change as well, right? So if you're taking the current system architecture on how uh, supercomputers are built and what's a node uh, and say, okay, I take a silicon inside that one particular thing and you know how much uh, efficient I can get, uh, the most ambitious uh, numbers I can throw, yeah, you land in that, you know, 10x range, maybe, you know, 20x, 30x, right? You know, if you combine all the technologies. But if you take the whole system and say, what, where is the energy going at the whole exaflop system level, okay? You see a ton of opportunity beyond, you know, the current CPU and the GPU that's inside one node, right? So that's, uh, you know, the system level thinking, and that's very much part of our Zeta scale uh, thinking is uh, what, what is the system level architecture um, changes that we need to do to be able to get to that interesting uh, compute density uh, and uh, performance per watt increases, right? So this, uh, you know, at, at an opportune time, we'll be laying out all those details. I won't go into all those details, but you know, suffice to say, there is enough opportunity. So it it sounds to me we're talking about paradigm shifts in order to get there. Yes, is, is you know just to just to concatenate everything that you said down into that simple phrase. Is that going to be Intel or Intel and its partners designing new presenting as potentials, or is it going to be customer driven? Because is it Henry Ford said if you just ask customers, all they want is faster horses. <laughs> So innovation has to happen at multiple levels. How are you going to marry the two by providing something that both your customers want, but is also innovative and yeah. both a paradigm shift, but not too much that they won't adopt it? Because yeah. that's always yeah. a barrier in these things as well. Yeah. And uh, there are two phases to that, Ian, is uh, the, the beauty of the supercomputing community, the HPC community. You know, they are... Uh, very eager first adopters of many things, right? I mean, they experiment, they lean in, uh, and even to sometimes just get the number, <laughs> right? You know, bragging rights number to kind of, you know, build uh, uh, software machines or like you know, to be the first guinea pigs on a new technology. So that's a good thing, uh, right? That there is that community and we are very passionate about that. That's my focus. Now, our goal, we said, is that it's not just building a bragging rights, you know, Zeta scale computer or something. We want to get this level of computing accessible to everyone. That is Intel's DNA, right? You know, the democratization of it. So that's the phase two of it, which you're asking as well, right? How do you kind of, you know, scale it uh, as well? Uh, and that's very much kind of in our thinking that every one of the technologies we pack into uh, uh, Zeta scale is something that actually is in our regular roadmap, our mainstream roadmap, right? And uh, in in some shape or form, and all that stuff, and uh, and and that's that's how we're thinking about it. It's funny you bring that up because I was going to go through some of the timescales that you went through with Patrick Kennedy from Serve the Home. Mm -hmm. um, he's annoying because I asked for this interview before you had that drink with him late at night. <laughs> <laughs> but, in that, but in that kind of interview, you said it was it said three phases. First, optimizing extra scale with next gen Xeon and GPU this year and next. Second phase in 24, 25, integrating Xeon and XE. Um, I think you called mm -hmm. it a Falcon product. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then Silicon Photonics, Lightbringer. Followed by a third phase, which I think with Patrick, you simply labeled Zeta scale because it's four or five years out and Intel doesn't talk about things that far out. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like you're aligning these phases with specific products, introductions into the market. Mm -hmm. Is that is that fair to say that what those are going to be the main drivers? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. So, yes. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, you know, obviously phase one and phase two we have more clarity on the products, right? And phase three is about um, the technology road roadmap, right? So when I use the word technology, by the way, just for kind of, you know, your your audience readers, it is like things like things that take 
a long time, like, you know, a new process technology or new packaging technology or next generation of silicon photonics, you know, those take a long time. Products are, you know, things like, you know, Sapphire Rapids or an alchemist or a battle mage where we pack these technologies into an, a, a particular architect, system architecture, right? Uh, if that um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, also with Patrick, who kind of went through this 1000x improvement. Um, and I kind of want to go through it with you just so I understand mm -hmm. where the delineations are. Uh, j just so everybody's aware, if you haven't watched uh, or seen Patrick's content on this, definitely should check it out. Um, but you said architecture is 16x, power and mm -hmm. thermals 2x, data movement 3x, and process is 5x. That's about 500x on top of the 2x. 2x a flop aurora system mm -hmm. gets mm -hmm. you your your zeta flop um just going through some of the specific numbers the 16x for architecture is the biggest contribution to that um should we think of that in pure ipc improvements or are we talking about a full spectrum of raw compute improvements combined with the paradigm shifts such as processing and memory and that sort of stuff in a combination of both i'd say but but the foundational stuff is the you know your IPC per watt improvement, right? I mean, it's, right. it is you know we know how to do 16x performance improvement pretty easy, right? Relatively, right? Um, so you burn but, the power. Yeah, but doing it uh, within uh, yeah you know the, without burning the power is the challenge there in terms of the both architecture and microarchitectural opportunities. Uh, that are ahead of us. So uh, on the power and thermal side, you mentioned 2x, which is you know the lowest multiplier, um, and the ability to use both lower voltage and better cooling, although I immediately heard it and thought, okay, we're going to start getting 800 to 1,000 watt GPUs. So bear with me on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, this, uh, but this sounds like uh, it's more around better power management, how to architect the power and the ability to you know, of the process for thermal packaging and voltages. Um, but yeah. that kind of moves into how architecture is done and then um, the other stuff you're talking about regarding packaging and integration. Do some of these numbers overlap so significantly it's hard to tell them apart in that, in that way? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, that the accounting for this, right? Some of them, for example, uh, have opportunities beyond 2x on, you know, when we say power and thermals, it's also power delivery, right? So if you just look at the way we build computers today, right, you know, just the regulator losses that you have uh, on, on hmm. how we deliver uh, uh, current to the chip, right? Uh, and with integration at system scale, there, there are opportunities. They are uh, not just kind of Intel identified opportunities. Uh, you know, many folks outside have called uh, you know, things like, hey, what if I can get higher voltage in, you know, can I drive lower current in uh, across all of this stuff, uh, right? So there are um, uh, opportunities there that, uh, and, and the data center folks have been taking advantage of some of this stuff, like, you know, the big hyperscalers, uh, but there is more uh, with uh, integration. So if, but if we, you said something uh, very interesting, right? If we viewed Zeta scale as a collection of components, right? Like GPUs, CPUs, you know, memories and all. And each of them are fed separate power, right? Oh, I have a 300 watt GPU and a 250 watt CPU and all. Um, you know, that's one way of doing the math, right? But uh, yep. I, I have uh, X amount of compute and Y amount of, uh, uh, you know, current that I need to deliver to that compute, right? you have uh, opportunities of, uh, you know, there are many losses today uh, because each component has its own separate delivery mechanisms yep. and all, right? So we waste a lot of energy because, um, you know, we're changing. Uh, the, the key uh, idea behind all of this stuff is that the unit of compute today, uh, when, you, when I say unit of compute, a CPU is a unit of compute, a G, single GPU yep. is a unit of compute. Um, there is no reason why they have to be that way, right? I mean, that's what yeah. we define for market reasons, product reasons, and all that stuff. 
what if your un new unit of compute is something different, right? You know, because each unit of compute has a particular overhead, right? Uh, uh, you know, beyond its core compute, how I deliver power to it, thermals, this, that, and cost too, right? You know, there are a bunch of materials on on the board and all that stuff that are repetitive and all that stuff. So historically, uh, and this is one of the foundations of Moore's law, was the integration. With the integration, we draw this and. Uh, you know, extraordinary kind of, you know, uh, things where now you have a supercomputer in your pocket, uh, uh, in, a, in a phone, right? Um, no, no reason that aspect of Moore's law needs to stop because there's still an opportunity just even beyond transistor stuff, just the integration aspect, integration driving um, some order of magnitude efficiencies. So I, w I was going to ask a question about silicon photonics because I think it's a really cool technology and I really think you need to amp that up a bit more. I'm spending more of my brain space looking into it. and and um, But I know we're going short on time and I do kind of want to still cover um, metaverse stuff. Um, and one topic that straddles the two, I think, is one API. We just had the launch of 1.0 Gold um and we're looking at 2.0 3.0 over the next few years so far what has been what's the pickup been like on one api what's the response the feedback but also yeah. beyond that future generations is it all just going to be about specific hardware optimizations smart compilers customer libraries can you sort of go into a little bit of detail there yeah sure uh the 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 pickup uh so far has been really good ian actually i think soon uh in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be sharing some uh, numbers on uh, uh, installs, user base, and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, the the key thing I'm looking forward to, and we are all looking forward to, is that when our GPU hardware starts becoming available through this year, we expect that uh, like a kind of the knee in the right. curve to happen, right? You know, that's when like you know more excitement. Yeah. Uh, developers have been using one API, like, you know, porting over and all, but they they want to test it on our new hardware, right? And uh, and, and I think that uh, that excitement and uh, we see that momentum coming later this year. So beyond uh, the current features of one API, if you call the phase one of one API is essentially, uh, you know, there are two aspects of it is, right? First, leveraging uh, the Xeon our x86 library base for our upcoming GPUs uh, and other hardware. And second is this data parallel uh, SIMT abstraction that's popularized by CUDA, OpenCL, et cetera, et cetera, right? A clean interface, a clean programming model that's available to all supporting everybody's hardware and all with kind of, you know, Intel's tools and, you know, a real uh, big investment. Uh, so that's phase one. Phase two would be particularly with the architectures that uh, I already hinted at coming, right? They uh, unlock new forms of parallelism, much more easier uh, uh, memory management, uh, and uh, will make it much easier for people to write uh, workloads that uh, deal with, you know, petabytes of data. Uh, as an example, right? And uh, all those features will come in in the next flavors of one API 2.0, 3.0, and all as the hardware evolves to make it all easy. So go, go, going going full on metaverse, um, metaverse and Zscale kind of, in my mind, they occupy occupy a very similar space. I mean, um, it's being co opted to essentially mean second life, virtual world um, iteration, you know, eerily reminiscent of Black Mirror episodes. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you've seen, um, they're quite weird. Um, but, you know, aside from a few mentions from Intel and a talk from you at the Real Time conference in December, Intel hasn't said too much about it, personally, mm -hmm. because I think it's still a lot of search engine buzzwords and not a <laughs> lot of substance. Um, but at the high level as a hardware vendor, when does Intel move from the sidelines to getting, you know, dipping their toe in the water? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Ian, actually, even though I uh, hesitated uh, using the word metaverse and other uh, buzzwords, uh, you know, even way back in 2018, you know, when I came here to Intel, I said uh, the thing uh, that I was passionate about and what kind of got me to Intel is this enabling of this fully immersive virtual worlds. Uh, that are accessible to everyone, 
and the amount of compute needed uh, is, you know, like I said, literally petaflops of compute, petabytes of storage, less than, you know, I said 10 milliseconds away from, uh, uh, you know, every human on the planet. Uh, that is the, uh, uh, that's the vision mission that we are on, Intel is on, we are still on. And if you actually just kind of, you know, think about what is a zeta scale computer or what, what's an exascale computer, right? It is like, you know, one cluster of machines that you can schedule a piece of one a work, right? I got some work to be done and I got access to X amount of machine, but I can submit one job like, and spray it across all these machines and get it done right fast. Um, when as the network latencies improve and all, you you are surrounded, you will be surrounded by this, like I said, this petaflop machines, like, you know, every uh, 10 mile radius in my, in my vision or hope or dream will have an exascale uh, computer, okay? <laughs> Whether it is, takes is that limited years, by that's... speed of light? The speed of light, <laughs> exactly, right? So the, uh, and, uh, um, Oh, you mean the 10 mile radius? Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. In fact, it's, yeah, yeah. 10 mile radius is limited by speed of light for your latencies. Uh, and that is what the computational fabric required to enable what in my vision is metaverse, right? So there are different forms of metaverse, like, you know, the toy ca cartoony stuff and all. There'll be lots of interesting versions of it. They'll all be useful. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, but that that kind of you know photoreal immersive stuff that i can get myself in and have this conversation that you and i are having where why aren't we like you know feel like we're in the same room and having a three-dimensional interaction here right uh, that <laughs> is the metaverse that i'm looking forward to where you know it erases like you know distances it erases geographical boundaries and like you know literally put us both in the same room and uh uh, you know, uh, me interacting with the best version of you <laughs> and you interacting <laughs> with the best version of me, right? That is uh, that is the metaverse I look forward to. So Intel, the second part of the question is, we will be, you know, progressively saying more things about um, our, you know, our take on it. And uh, like I said at the um, real-time conference, there are three layers, the way we are looking at it, the mm -hmm. compute infrastructure layer, uh, which is fundamentally what our hardware roadmap, silicon roadmaps, you know, improving per, per watt, et cetera, et cetera. The second is infrastructure layer. And uh, we have been at work on uh, creating an interesting uh, system and uh, infrastructure software there. I'll be saying more about that in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we showed some demonstrations of uh, what we've been working on at the RTC. And then the last layer is what I call intelligence layer, which is how do you leverage all the new AI techniques and all? How do you package them all up so that, you know, you effectively deliver more compute, uh, uh, you know, or more higher visual experience to a low power device um, uh, more productively? So that's kind of the way we are thinking about Metaverse. And you'll see us say and talk more about it, whether we'll lean into the term Metaverse or Web3 or some other, you know, buzzword. <laughs> That's that's you know I'll, I'll leave it to others uh, for that, but we are we are working away. It's uh, metaverse feels like a, like a continuation of virtual reality with added just added layers and complexity. So, I mean, the adoption of virtual reality hasn't been universal, and the metaverse feels like it might become a subset of VR. Is is is, is there really value in that to go after those sort of VR like outcomes? Do you think? Yeah, I, you know, for, to me, even if I remove VR just for a second, right? You know, the last two years we have all been stuck in front of a, you know, some resolution display, <laughs> surrounded by display, right? Yep. And uh, even without wearing a headset, right? You know, I think a more immersive uh, collaboration environment would have served us all well. Right. And uh, you were just uh, complaining about some uh, Zoom feature that you wanted and all that stuff. And I'm talking about 1000x the Zoom features. Right. <laughs> and um, yeah. so I, I, I'm I'm of the mind that like, you know, they'll be we'll be surrounded by, you know, like millions of pixels, one shape or form. OK. And uh, we can leverage those pixels to provide much more productive experiences than we are doing today. 
Okay. That that is my uh, foundational thing uh, for metaverse. Whether those pixels you wear them on your headset or they'll be AR, VR, and all, I think they will be one of the tools uh, that we have, right? And uh, you know, I, I remember a decade ago when I was at Apple, like, and it's like, you know, debate on hey, why are we still building this big? Uh, 27 inch uh, panels, right? Who cares? <laughs> right? You know, everybody is on the phone. <laughs> right? So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. It's, I know we're going to time, and I'm really sure that we could spend two, three, four more hours talking about all this stuff. Thank you, Raja, for your time. Um, good luck. I'll see what those one API numbers look like. Um, and yeah, I'll hold you to 1000x compute. A lot of people are really interested in it. Thanks, Ian.